Welcome to the Mile High Podcast. This is your host, Dr. Daniel Knowles, coming to you from an altitude of 5,280 feet, discussing tick. If you are watching or listening to this podcast on one of the many channels that's available, make sure to hit subscribe. You never want to miss a week of Mile High Tick. And of course, if you have not already cleared your calendar and marked it in stone, be sure at to be at Mile High, August 20th to 23rd, 2020. Easy date to remember, it's all 20s. And we look forward to seeing you there and reserve your seats as soon as you can. Uh, I am super thrilled to have as a guest on the Mile High podcast, one of our upcoming speakers for Mile High this year, uh, and really a good friend. We have more and more common, in common, I'm learning each day. Dr. Dan Lyons is a lifelong Wisconsin, Wisconsin native, which we do not have in common, uh, but he's completed his undergraduate well, we don't degree hold that in biology against you. and biochem and Palmer College and graduated in 96, which we do have in common. We both graduated in 1996 from different institutions, but uh, have been practicing that long. He's opened his first home office in his hometown and now is relocated uh, to Green Bay in 2005. He's always been involved and had a really high uh, focus on bettering the profession and bettering chiropractors alongside of helping his community. Uh, he adopted a class at Palmer College. He served as president of several chiropractor organizations uh, and uh, really assist with uh, uh, Gonstead research, uh, furthering Gonstead in chiropractic research, and also uh, teaching philosophy as a philosophy diplomat. So welcome, and we are honored to have you here, uh, Dr. Dan Lyons. Thank you much, Dan. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, and, and anytime I get to talk to you, I'm thrilled. I know our audience is really going to be um, delighted with what we discuss and share today and helping them deepen their understanding of chiropractic. And, and starting off, um, let's have people get to know you a little bit better than they may know uh, or better than my introduction. How did you find your world into chiropractic? Uh, that's, a, that's a long story. Um, it, it really started, and I think I might have said this before on the um, on the uh, subluxation summit, I, I broke my neck in a car accident in 1990. Broke my neck in five spots, crushed my spinal cord, uh, had a complete dislocation. And uh, so I, I currently have a three level surgical fusion. And, uh, you know, I was, I was already in the biological sciences there and was thinking about going to med school and it really kind of got turned off to medicine just because my, my surgeon was such a jerk. Great surgeon, but, you know, was, was not, had no bedside manner. And so for people that think that bedside manner doesn't matter, you, you should probably rethink that. Um, recently, my, my sister needed to have, so, have someone look at her neck, and I sent it to that guy, and I said, he's a good surgeon, but he's a jerk. And she came back and said, yep, he is a jerk. So, you know, 20 years, 25 years later, still no change, 30 years later. But, uh, so, but I really appreciated the, the importance of the nervous system more after that because, I mean, I pretty much lived in a gym in undergrad, and, and I went from, you know, 200, a, a lean 265 pounds uh, to – about 190, 195 pounds in a week. Uh, the pressure on my sc spinal cord, I just shriveled up. My friends would come over from the gym. I had like 18, 19 inch arms and they would just say, we can see you getting smaller as we sit here. And so then uh, I, I knew I didn't want to do go into uh, medicine and I knew I didn't want to sit in the lab, but the other thing, because I got my biochemistry degree, I didn't want to do those things. And I, I thought of my chiropractor, you know, and, and he loved what he did and everybody seemed to love him. And I'm like, well, you know, he seems to make a lot of money and he likes what he's doing and, and can do what he wants. So that seems like a pretty good idea. I called him up and he said, yeah. And he wrote me a letter to Palmer and there you have it. And then when I got to Palmer, you know, um, I didn't know my, my doc was pretty much a diversified with a little bit of SOT 
thrown in there. Um, I'd been under activator care very briefly, and uh, I, when I got down to school, I just was going to go look at everything. So, you know, so I looked at every club, but I had some friends that were uh, in, in the Gonstead work, and then I had some classmates that I just met that they, they had relatives that were Gonstead chiropractors. And so as I went through everything, it just, it made the most sense to me. And so next thing I know, I'm in the Troxel intern program, which is still in existence today. Shout out to Josh Lawler, still running the program. And, and now I, now I teach and, and help run organizations do research. It just, it, it never wavered. There's always something, there's always more to learn, but as long as it's all making sense, then you stay the course. And, you know, uh, I, I always have this outlook that you're always growing and you're always helping other people to grow. Mm -hmm. Those are two things you're always doing. Uh, in life in general, as a chiropractor, it's very important to do those two things. Uh, and obviously, we're helping people grow in our practices, but we also need to do that with our colleagues um, yeah. and ourselves and our families. Uh, very much so. That brings it to a point now, uh, which is something that we discussed prior uh, and many people have said, which is, uh, you know, I hear frequently, but it's important to hit on because I think this is very near and dear to you. Chiropractic always works. It works 100% of the time when it doesn't seem to or doesn't appear to examine your application, but don't question the principle of chiropractic. Um, I, I think that's a lot of how you live your life. Um, what can you say about that? Well, you know, that's is one of my favorite Clarence Gonstead quotes. And, and, and I do believe that the whole chiropractic works slogan came from there. And if, if at mile high, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to go over this and I've, I've brought it up a number of times, especially in the philosophy diplomate when we're teaching that, but you know, we have a lot of people that have bumper sticker philosophy. You know, when, when you are looking at yourself, when you're introspective and you want to, really take assessment. You want your your philosophy, your science, and your art. You want to be deep in those, like Mariana Trench deep. Uh, but many people are shot glass deep. I mean, they just, they don't have the, the full understanding. And so when someone says above, down, inside, out, you know, that could be a dietitian slogan as well as a chiropractic slogan. So we, we have to look at those things. And so too many people will say, you know, well, you know, it's uh, principle 24, limitations of matter. That's why the patient didn't get it better. Or it was principle six. It's, you know, time. And that's the, the depth of that. But some things, uh, they're not chiropractic problems. You know, when I, when I broke my neck and I crushed my spinal cord, and I've seen and worked on people with spinal cord injuries, you know, uh, with partial dislocations, and, and, and uh, uh, Dr. Greg Plogger, uh, when I was in school, he came out and did a presentation just on uh, fractures and dislocations taken care of by chiropractors. And I'm not saying recommending anybody go do that. You you are the doctor, so you get to make that call when that patient's in your office. But there are people that have done it, and you know the difference with mine is I had five fractures, and if they would have tried to reduce the dislocation without fusing those fractures you would have pulled everything apart. And I had three arch fractures, a spinous and a transverse fracture. So you were gonna create a big problem if you tried to do that. I was a surgical case. And if they would have waited for my, cause my fractures weren't really displaced much, if they would have waited for those to, to fuse together naturally, uh, who knows? I mean, I was, I already lost 65 pounds, 70 pounds in a week. Uh, I had no digestion. Whatever I ate just look, came out just looking chewed up. So would I have been alive if I had waited the two months it would have taken to safely reduce those? Probably not. So sometimes there are surgical cases. But you have to look. Are you, trying to, are you chasing a symptom? Is that what you're trying to do? Because that's not chiropractic. Um, are you trying to cavitate a joint? Because that's not chiropractic. And really looking at our application and, you know, and in the Gonstead world, uh, you know, we have this, this model where there are, you have the subluxation at center and then you have your tools using to find it. So you have your symptomatology, Hey, you know, the Merrick chart works. 
Uh, it worked for years. It's not 100. percent It's not even you know you know maybe 50 percent on a good day. But every once in a while, uh, there are some useful symptomatic clues that a patient gives you. You have your instrumentation, you have your palpation, your visualization, and your X-rays. And if you're not looking at all of those, you're missing some piece of that pie. And so when you look at people going to day-to-day -day practice, you know, the schools are trying to empower you and, and teach you all the skills, but some of it you have to practice. That's why it's called practice. And we expect to be, you know, uh, Clarence Gonsteads, we expect to be uh, Clay Thompson's, we expect to be these type of doctors when we graduate from school. But when you graduate from school, you haven't even likely had the requirements require you to have less than one patient visit a day for a year. So, you know, a former athlete, you know, well, I'm going to teach you to shoot a basketball, shoot a free throw, but you only get to do it 250 times in a year period and then you get then you go pro you're not going to be very good at that and when we look at the like one of my buddies did the math on clarence gonstead and he had uh by the time he started teaching he had over based upon the average number of visits a chiropractor sees today he had about 250 years of clinical experience by the time he started teaching that is where you become a one of the legends in the profession. And not many people are really wanting to do that. Right. We, we like being celebrities, uh, you know, Facebook and Instagram and stuff, you know, help doing people that. Uh, we like having a lifestyle. You know, most of the, our, the legendary chiropractors of your, they didn't lead very extravagant lifestyles. They were in an office right. all day long, six, seven days a week, so. Right. It's, it's just that mindset. Right. Well, they they, they had a, a service focus, you know, to change sure. people's lives and health for the better and to be an instrument of that. Um, now, you said something to me that I don't know anything about. So I'm very curious about this. All right. Uh, which is, who who is Dr. Phyllis? Okay, so uh, Dr. Phyllis, and I don't think I have a picture. Uh, no, uh, it's her picture's out in the out in the hall, so patient can see it. So, if you if you uh, read, there's a book out. Uh, one of my friends wrote, uh, published last year, called uh, Gonstead the Adjuster, and so Dr. Gonstead never had any intention on starting a technique or anything. He just was, you know, working six six days a week. And he had a patient who had lost her fiance in a car accident that almost killed her. And then he put her back together and then she decided she wanted to be a chiropractor. And so he sent her down to Lincoln College because they were doing full spine work and Palmer was doing upper cervical only. And then she did a little trip to BJ and then she moved back to Wisconsin. And she had married while she was in school and there was a couple other friends from school that were back in the area and they, she convinced Dr. Gonstead to teach them what he was doing. And that's Dr. Phyllis Markham. And so she, he had a soft spot for her in his heart. So they had a meeting one Sunday and it lasted about 15 minutes. And she said, Dr. Gonstead got frustrated, stood up and says, I can't teach you kids anything. You don't know anything. Get the hell out of here. And so she begged and he said, all right, you got to read these textbooks and learn this stuff and then we'll start doing it. And then when they started seeing what he was doing, uh, Dr. Phyllis and her husband, uh, Dr. Ted Markham, they said, you know, you have to start teaching this. And Dr. Gonstead said, well, put together a seminar and I'll show up and teach it. And so that's how it happened. And she eventually, they sold their practice. She ran Dr. Gonstead's x-ray room, uh, x-ray department. And Dr. Uh, Ted ran the seminars for years. And so that's part of why I have my affinity for x-ray uh, because I spent so much time with her. I mean, I, she was like a grandmother to me and I would stop by her place at lunch and after work and go over films with her. And she lived right next to my first office. And, 
And uh, she was just an amazing woman. She could look at an unmarked set of x-rays and pretty much tell you what symptoms the patient had just from looking at the film. She had forgotten more about x-rays than probably any 10 people alive know. And I know in my experience, in, in many ways, as, as actually we see in some areas of, of medicine as well, um, things become a lost art. Like we see that in, in medicine with listening through a tethos stethoscope being somewhat of a lost art in that field. And I think x-ray interpretation is somewhat yeah. of a lost art, sadly, in our profession. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, too many people just look for a listing or, you know, is there any contraindication there? But sadly, most people don't take x-rays in the profession. You know, I'd probably place that number around 30%. I don't know. Right. Uh, right. That, that terrifies me. The only x-rays I've ever regretted are the ones I didn't take. You know, uh, I, I had a patient come in a couple of years ago who uh, just was adamant about not having films and he'd seen another Gonstead doctor and so I called down there and got the listings and uh, in the process figured out that they didn't have films on them. And I, I adjusted the, the guys the last time I've ever done this. I adjusted him and I said, if you, if you get results, and he was driving about an uh, hour and a half to see me, but it was saving him an hour from going to this other doctor. And so I said, uh, if you if you want to be a patient here, you got to have films. And he says, all right. He called me back. He says, yeah, I'm doing good. So we'll get films on Monday. Well, he died on the weekend. He had cancer. It was in the spine. And that's the stuff that ends careers. I mean, what right. was it? 43, uh, Dr. O'Keefe, who used to teach at Palmer, she had a classmate that they had voted. He, he was going to be the next, you know, great name in the profession. He was just outstanding. And he convinced I uh, had someone come in when he was getting set up to adjust him uh, without films, knew his listings and stuff. And the guy ended up having TB of the spine, fractured a vertebra. That guy never saw a day of practice. You know, uh, it's, it can be, fortunately, most of those people don't end up in the office, but you know, the, the things, the, the x-rays that I bring up when I'm, when I'm doing a talk or teaching uh, are shocking to frightening. Right. Just had a, a gal come back in after 10 years because she, she felt good. She knew better than you know, me. And uh, uh, I, I've never seen an MRI this bad. She has stenosis. There are spots where her central canal is no bigger than a pea. Uh, wow. I, I wouldn't want to work on that without an x-ray. Right. So, right. right. But well, yeah, she was, Dr. Phyllis was amazing teeny little woman she would study that she'd use her hands like this anybody that's seen, has seen a videotape or knew her would she'd be looking at your hips going like this and then she'd uh just say she'd always say i like to look at butts because she'd watch you the way you walked and visualize how your hips were moving and figure out your pelvis so that everything else loosened up yeah she was amazing well it comes back to having actually reverence for how but negatively impactful subluxation is to the body and how positively impactful the adjustment is to the body. Absolutely. And, and reverence is a great word. That, then the analysis is not valued either. No, I, I would say, you know, everybody wants to, you go to go to a school and do a workshop and everybody wants to learn how to adjust. You know, uh, the, the technique portions of the, any seminar are always the biggest ones um, because that's, that's what people think is sexy, you know, but uh, everyone knows who's the best at bench or chair or whatever, but no one knows who the, who's, who's the best at scoping or who's the best at palpating or who's the best at analyzing x-rays. No one, no one in, in school right now can say, Oh yeah, Steve, he's a great palpator. He can find anything. It's just, right. it doesn't happen because right. that's, people think that's boring. And then, yeah, you know, uh, I, we, and I, I, a lot of it, I think, is is uh, because of insurance acceptance. I mean, right now, most people run an insurance practice, and you are paid on whether or not you deliver an adjustment. And I always used to say, adjustments are free, the analysis costs, because 
the goal should be to come in and get checked and not to get adjusted. I found a, I guess I don't have it here. I was going through some files at home, found my daughter's old travel card from when she was a, a newborn. And you would see all these DNAs did not adjust, did not adjust on there. Um, people shouldn't have to get adjusted every time they come in. And so uh, one of the things that I always enjoy about talking to you is, is learning uh, more about philosophy, learning about um, uh, Gonstead, about research. Uh, and, you know, it's so great to have you on the Subluxation Science Summit and also good to have you on the, great to have you on the Mile High Philosophy panel one year. Um, uh, what is something that you wish you had known? That I wish I had known? Yeah. At what point in my life? In practice. Oh. I wish I had known. Um, and that's, that's, a, that's a big list. Um, uh, I think that the, probably, I wish I'd known more business classes. I mean, I've never, never lost money in a year, but I definitely, you know, could have used some, some business coaching at some point early on. Um, but practice wise, Oh, uh, I think early on, you know, when you start out, you gotta, you gotta understand that there's going to be a few painful lessons. Patients are going to quit. It doesn't mean anything about you and that they, the patients, they don't communicate well. I mean, I, I talked about this gal that came back after 10 years. Um, she, she loved my care. She just felt good and disappeared. And I didn't communicate well enough that you, you need to keep uh, protecting your spine. You invested a bunch of time, money, and energy into getting it healthy. And if you don't keep spending some time, some money, and some energy investing in that, it's going to go, it's going to go south. Just like, you have to keep cutting your hair, brushing your teeth, mowing your lawn. I mean, you can, the list goes on and on. You can do those things. And, and every once in a while, there's someone that shows up out of the blue and they say, they give you a big hug and say, you know, you have no idea how much you changed my life. And I'm like, you're a hundred percent right. You just disappeared off the face of my planet, didn't return a call. And, and now you're back and you tell me these great things and, and to celebrate those wins, you know, my, my wife, Brooke, is amazing at celebrating the wins and and I just kind of I'm kind of even keel I just go along and and she's she wants to celebrate all those victories and all those joys and and I I think doing that more helps um, it feeds your soul really and to and to write all those things down when you have those awesome things happen write them down so when you're having a bad day uh, you know, if you live and die by the new patients, like most chiropractors seem to, uh, you know, open up that book and just read some of the things that people have said uh, and done, uh, been able to do because of the care that you've given to, to lift you up. And then so one more, man, I didn't realize how you ask, you're good at this. I mean, you ask a question, all of a sudden it starts going down uh, those rabbit holes. Uh, document everything way more uh, than you do take pictures. I had a little, we were at a wedding the other day and a little girl that was sitting at her table or she's super pigeon toed. And so her mom brought her in and she was in for her uh, second visit. First visit already, her feet went from being about 45 degrees turned in to maybe about 10 or 15 degrees. So a huge change overnight. And her, her mom was like, wow, I, I didn't think it was going to happen that fast. And now, um, her grandfather lives next door and he told me that her feet are straight already. So two visits, feet completely straight. I didn't take a picture of her feet that first day. I should have. So her mom's digging through old pictures because I'm sure they have some of that. But especially now with kids, I mean, you got everybody on the planet seeming to uh, say, oh, you shouldn't be seeing kids. Well, here's a little girl like, tripping and falling all the time and you know, how kids are these days, how, how mean they can be. Here's a little just over one-year-old girl that could potentially 
have been made fun of and really gotten hurt from a fall because she trips over that, that won't have that now. Right. 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 You know, uh, let's talk about um, the diplomat program because you're a philosophy diplomat. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a lack of philosophy education overall in in chiropractic, sadly. Um, Why is the uh, ACP and then the diplomat program important? Uh, you know, it's really the, the glue that, that holds everything together. Um, uh, science is great, but knowing how that science is relevant to anything is really the practice of philosophy. And, and uh, I know that I'm a big fan of some of Ayn Rand's work. And she has a quote, you know, as a human being, you have, there is no doubt that you need a philosophy. <clears throat> Your only choice is whether you uh, rationally define that philosophy through scrupulously logical deliberation, or, or you let it randomly accumulate as a result of advertising and slogans and half-truths uh, to coalesce as an anchor where your mind's wings should have grown. And that's not 100%. It's fairly close, but I mean, that's true. You've got to think about these things. I mean, anybody can can tell you that your your temperature is, you know, 98 degrees or 101 degrees, but what does that mean? That's philosophy. Uh, that's not necessarily science. You know, maybe it's supposed to be high. Maybe it's not supposed to be high. You know, if you if you have are, have an infection and you hit your skin, your temperature is 98 degrees, you're sick. <laughs> And I, I mean, sick as in malfunctioning because you right. should have a fever. Right. Uh, so really understanding your place in the world is, is philosophy. Understanding how to interact with other professions and people in the profession, that is philosophy. And, you know, we, we go over some of that real briefly in the f- start of the year two. So the uh, Sherman College. I think you know someone that went to Sherman, someone fairly important, someone might be on the Board of Regents. Uh, and uh, they they do year one. Uh, Dr. Bill Deccan runs that. They do a great mm-hmm. job. Uh, I think they got one going on in Chile right now, and I think they're starting another one in Europe. Uh, and then it, the Center for Chiropractic Progress, we do the year two and three. And so we go over a little bit of the basics, but then we pretty much stick to serious chiropractic philosophy. We do a lot of it out of the green books. We do bring a fair amount of current science and we go over all aspects. So the next weekend that we have it is the first weekend in November. And that's going to be actually be the technique weekend where we're going to have, you know, uh, we'll have a Gonstead. I think we have Thompson. I think we have a toggle recoil, upper cervical doc coming in, going over, their system as uh, as viewed through the eyes of the filter of philosophy and it's it's amazing i mean those are those are my some of my favorite weekends to go teach because the thought is so deep right right yes and so and and we will put in the blog post that goes along with the podcast the link for that but how do people, so people can plug in, but how do people uh, get connected with starting uh, those programs? Uh, so you can start year two. We have one person doing year two and three before they, they do the ACP. They're waiting for the ACP to come back to Chicago. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, but if you want to start year one, um, uh, you have to go to Sherman's Continuing Ed website and they, they'll have those years on there. Chiroprogress.org is where you can find out about the year two and three and the diplomate. And there's, uh, we probably have maybe 10% of the people that are eligible for their diplomate have gone through the diplomate process. Right now we have 12 people in the class, 10 people in the class. And um, the, but there are hundreds of people that have gone through year one. And so it's one of those things. It's, it is valuable, but it is not having your philosophy diplomates, not going to put any more money in your practice directly. Uh, 
people always ask how come some, you know, people don't show up uh, to the diplomate the way they show up to other seminars is because, you know, if you're learning how to do, you know, any other non-chiropractic but billable under a chiropractic license thing, uh, whether it's laser or, you know, grasp and, you know, something like that, that's, they, they think that's going to earn them more money as opposed to having rock solid understanding, a, you know, bedrock foundation of what we do so that you don't waver and you're able to communicate that message better. That will improve your practice as well. And you're not doing those other things. Outstanding. Outstanding. Now, um, uh, you came, oh, there you're back in focus. You're out of focus. Now you're in focus. Kind of like subluxated, not subluxated. Uh, <laughs> with that, one last thing I want to cover in just the few moments we have left, um, which is uh, the, the research that you're involved with. You're involved with research, chiropractic research is chiropractic research, but particularly Gonser research. Uh, what is your position involvement with that or has it been? And, and what's something that you can share about the, the got research in the Gonster world? Well, we have, uh, uh, with, through the adaptability symposium that the Center for Chiropractic Progress put on, you know, I did some stuff with patients in HRV and that data has been shipped off to, to be looked at by the PhD that's going to be doing that. Um, there's a bunch of smaller projects that are going on. There's, there's always through the, um, the Gonstead Clinical Studies Society, uh, Dr. Roger Coleman, who runs that research department. The, the whole purpose of the Gonstead Clinical Studies Society is to raise money and do research. And so you know, basically we want to quantify every aspect of the, the Gonstead system and how it applies and show that it is repeatable, it is uh, accurate and, and precise. And so there's work that's been done with uh, the X-ray uh, Joel Alcantara and uh, Mark Lopes have done some stuff showing the, the importance of the tube tilt with regards to the pelvis. So pretty much everybody has seen the, the Gonstead pelvic analysis, but if you don't have a, about a 12 degree caudal tube tilt, when you mark those, there are certain cases where your AS and your PI will not be accurate. So uh, a lot of people take sectionals, you know, now as we move to uh, the digital world, very few people actually have the ability to take a full spine um, A to P or lateral film, film. So now we have to tilt the tube and make sure that the central ray is located, you know, right about the xiphoid process. Otherwise, you're not getting an accurate pelvic measurement. So, you know, just taking, picking apart the, the aspects of daily practice a little bit and say, this is testable, this isn't. You know, looking at, you know, we have uh, ideas to do studies when it regards with palpation, you know. Uh, pretty much everybody chiropractor, every chiropractor uses palpation of some form, but most of the studies that have been done, you know, are not, don't, uh, don't uh, bode well for the accuracy or the discretion of, of the palpation. And is that because of who they're using? You know, a lot of these things are using students. So, you know, student necessarily not going to be a good palpator. Is it because of how they palpate? You know, uh, I know some of the, the people that uh, taught palpation, I've seen classes over the years where they are, they're pushing through, they're looking for the end, end range of motion. Well, you know, that's different than the way that we typically palpate. We're looking for the first thing that happens. Uh, and then, you know, how accurate is palpation without an x-ray? I mean, if you've got facet symmetry uh, uh, or tropism, then you're going to have a problem. And I remember being in school, I used to have, uh, before I had this lovely head of no hair, I used to have long, long hair. And I remember being in chiropractic college and someone was palpating my neck and they thought it was really, really stuck. And I could feel her hands starting to move around to try to adjust me, you know, to set up on it. And I was like, hold on, cowboy. And I lifted up my, my long hair because he didn't know I had a fusion. You know, he just, oh, it feels stuck. Well, 
if you have an x-ray, then you don't ever worry about that. So there's, they go together. Palpation with an x-ray is far more accurate and valuable than, than palpation without an x-ray. And I've yet to see a study that shows that you can palpate super accurately without one. So doing stuff like that. I mean, there's so much stuff that needs to be done. Uh, I think a lot of it can be done with, without a lot of money, but there is always that aspect too. And having an IRB that, that is going to get it published someplace. You know, right. We, right. A lot of our research just never goes anywhere. Unlike the, uh, the Dick Holtz study, you know, with our uh, upper cervical and blood pressure that was on the front page of WebMD for what, eight months. You know, it's huge stuff. Everyone that like twice a year, I still get someone coming in with that study in their hand saying, you know, can chiropractic help my blood pressure? Maybe, maybe not. It's not the goal, but uh, if, if you have a subluxation that's affecting your blood pressure, then, then yes. And the, uh, but he paid a lot of money. I was told he paid over $200,000 to get that study done. That's not chump change. Right. Right. And, and that's what, you know, what, what we need more of actually in chiropractic. So thank you for all the energy that you put into chiropractic. Thank you for uh, all you do for research, all you do for philosophy and helping better, better uh, chiro chiropractic overall and chiropractors overall. And, very grateful to be on that path with you and uh, that we're both in the same number of years here is, is very interesting uh, and have the same name. So uh, and we're both good looking. Yeah, there you go. So <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you for having me on. I'm grateful that you'll be at mile high again this year. I know you enjoyed it the last couple of years that you were there yep. uh, as, as did your other half. I'm so glad to have you being on stage this year. Um, and, and, and thank you for so much for giving to, to chiropractic. Is there any last thing you'd like to say uh, in closing out the podcast? I just want to say thank you. I mean, to have the vision to, to put this together, you know, I, I've been putting together seminars for what, 24 years now. It's no easy task. Uh, and I have a lot of people involved in, in the nonprofit. So uh, you putting it on your own shoulders and your staff's shoulders and doing it and having a vision and creating the space. I mean, it's, it's really nice because it is a, a melting pot. There's a lot of people from all different walks in the profession. Some of my favorite conversations I've had in the last few years have been at mile high and it wouldn't have happened because of you. Uh, so oh. thank you. Thank you. You know, it's as, as, as with you, it's a, a vision and calling to serve and better chiropractic. So, and that's what we're doing with this podcast too. So thank you everybody. Again, if you've watched this podcast and you enjoyed it or listened to it on iTunes or Stitcher, share it, hit subscribe. You don't want to miss uh, an episode. We have lots of great episodes coming up I have, uh, that are scheduled and we look forward to seeing you on higher ground at Mile High. You can reserve your seats, uh, www.milehighchiro.org and the registration link is there. You can use the savings code podcast to save. Uh, off the registration too. And we look forward to seeing you uh, August 20th to 23rd uh, uh, at Mile High 2020. We will see you then and keep changing uh, spines and lives and minds with chiropractic.